Hello, welcome to Minor Murderers, Children Who Kill. I'm your host, Tracy Perger. This is episode one. I chose to cover the story of Centoya Brown first because it was the first case of a minor murderer that caught my attention. I first became interested in this case when it happened because it occurred in my mother's neighborhood, which is typically a fairly quiet suburb of Nashville, Tennessee. I wasn't really into true crime yet, but I followed this case and a few other local cases. The Centoya Brown case is an interesting one for many reasons. As the case unfolds, you'll see why it is riddled with controversy. I'm going to do my best to present it in an unbiased way and let you form your own opinions about it. This is what we know for sure. Centoya Brown was a 16-year-old prostitute and Johnny Allen was her 43-year-old John. On Friday, August 6, 2004, he picked her up near the Sonic Restaurant on Murfreesboro Road in Antioch, Tennessee, shortly before closing time, and bought her dinner. The Sonic car hop testified that Brown looked uncomfortable. Allen then brought her to his house. The next thing we know for sure is that Brown called 911 at about 7.20 p.m. on August 7th and stated that there was a homicide and she gave the address. When police arrived, they discovered the body of Johnny Allen lying on his side very close to the edge of the bed. He was facing the wall and his fingers were clasped together next to his pillow. There was a dresser along the wall he was facing. There was one bullet entry wound on the back of his head and an exit wound on the front. Police noted that Allen's wallet and keys were missing and there was no vehicle in the driveway. There were many guns in the home, but police would later discover that Brown had also stolen two. Shortly after the 10 o'clock news that night, police received a phone call from a man claiming to have information about the murder on Mossdale Drive. He requested to meet police at a local grocery store. He told the officers who met him there that the murder was committed by Centoya. He said he lived a few doors down from her at the in-town suites and that she had told his roommate about the murder. When Centoya was arrested at about 3 a.m. on August 8th, she gave the police a fake name and told them that she was 18. They would soon discover that her name was Centoya Brown and that she was only 16 years of age. Georgina Mitchell was a wild teenager in 1987. She was a 16-year-old pregnant white girl. The baby's father was black. Georgina's racist mother told her that she was not allowed back in her house until she had gotten rid of the baby. Georgina didn't want to get an abortion, so she ran away to Clarksville, Tennessee and moved in with her sister. Clarksville is about 55 miles northwest of Nashville and minutes from Fort Campbell, Kentucky, which is home to the 101st Airborne Army Base. Georgina was friends with a black kid named John with whom she hung out often. She stated at one point that John could possibly be the father of her child, but she couldn't know for sure who the father was because she had slept with a few of her peers and would occasionally have sex with older men for money. She spent a lot of time at John's house and developed a relationship with his mother, Ellenette Brown. Ellenette was a substitute teacher and a natural with kids. Even though Georgina was close to Ellenette and trusted her, there were things she didn't tell her. She hid the fact that she was consuming alcohol, many times hard liquor, daily. She failed to mention that there was a history of mental illness and suicide attempts by many of her close family members, and she never told Ellenette that she was pregnant. Ellenette was taken aback when she received a phone call from John on January 29, 1988, in which he told her that Georgina was in the hospital because she had just given birth to a baby girl. Georgina named the baby Centoya and introduced Ellenette to her when she came to visit the hospital. After Centoya was born, Georgina stopped going by Ellenette's house. When Centoya was about six months old, Georgina came by as if she'd been coming by often. She asked Ellenette to babysit, and Ellenette agreed. Centoya was adorable and wiggled her way right into Ellenette's heart. When Georgina walked out the door that day, no one expected that it would be over a year before she would return for her daughter. During that year, Ellenette and her husband Thomas obtained legal guardianship of Centoya so that they could take her to the doctor when necessary, leave her at a daycare, and so on. When Georgina turned up a year later, John found out that she had spent that time working as a prostitute in Nashville, drinking and using drugs, and had even spent some time in jail. When Ellen had had to leave for work, she left 18-month-old Centoya with Thomas and expressly told him, if Georgina comes around, do not let her take Centoya. Sure enough, Georgina knocked on the door when only Thomas and Centoya were home. After pressuring him for quite some time, giving Thomas a phone number and promising that she would be back quickly, 
Thomas reluctantly agreed to let Georgina take Centoya shopping. Hours later, he called Ellenette at work, frantic because Georgina had not brought Centoya back. They contacted the Clarksville police and filed a report. Months later, Ellenette received word from Georgina's sister that she and Centoya were in Georgia. Ellenette launched her own investigation and found that they were living in a housing project in Columbus, Georgia. Six months after Centoya went missing, Ellenette drove seven hours with the papers in hand, proving that the state of Tennessee had given her guardianship. Ellenette went to the Columbus Police Department, showed them the papers, and told them everything that she had discovered. It was then that Ellenette was told that Georgina was in jail. The Columbus Police located Centoya at a home where Georgina had left her with another elderly couple. The child ran to Ellenette, happy to see her. During the six months that Centoya was missing, Thomas, who was career army, had been deployed to Saudi Arabia, and John had moved out. So when the pair arrived from Georgia, the house was empty, and it would be just the two of them for the next year until Thomas came home. Also during the time that Centoya had been missing, the child had changed. Ellenette was in the dark about what she had been through during that time, but whatever it was, it had left Centoya afraid of people. She was petrified of being with anyone except Ellenette. Over the next year, the two became extremely close. Thomas arrived back home when Centoya was three. The two had a strained relationship from that point on for a few reasons. One, Thomas was an intruder into the relationship that she had forged with Ellenette. Secondly, as a former army man, Thomas was loud, strict, and rigid. Thomas also had a drinking problem, and when he was drunk, he had an eruptive temper. Hateful words would spew from his mouth like venom towards the light-skinned little girl. Throughout her childhood, Thomas would often tell Centoya that she was going to end up a druggie and a prostitute, just like her mother. One night, when Centoya was nine, Ellenette threatened to dump Thomas's brandy down the drain. He threw a lamp at her before grabbing her by the throat and choking her. Word of the attack got back to John. John came to the house the following day to confront his stepfather. Ellenette was at work. During the conversation, John attacked Thomas and the two got into a scuffle. Centoya, afraid that John was going to hurt her dad, grabbed a knife. Then she grabbed the phone and called 911. Centoya was afraid of Thomas after that. That experience caused irreparable damage to the child. Centoya harbored resentment toward her biological mother for years for abandoning her. When Centoya was 10 years old, she found a box of letters that Georgina had written to Centoya over the years that Ellenette had hidden. Ellenette thought that she was protecting Centoya from Georgina's toxic lifestyle and empty promises, but Centoya didn't see it that way. She resented Ellenette for keeping the letters from her. After that, whenever Centoya was home, she stayed in her room. She didn't want to hang out with Ellenette anymore. Centoya was an extremely bright child. She was placed in a program for gifted children, which unfortunately made her a target for bullies. She was picked on for being so smart and for being light-skinned while having two black parents. Centoya lashed out at the other students by getting into altercations with them. She would also cuss out the teachers and give sarcastic answers when asked a question. When she was in the seventh grade, Centoya was given the ACT test that is typically only given to high school seniors. She achieved an average score for a high school senior at the age of 12. Shortly after that, however, Centoya was arrested and charged with stealing jewelry from a classmate's mother. They chose to place her on probation and sent her to Alternative School, a school for at-risk students. During the psychological evaluation, she threatened to kill her father and accused him of raping her. She later admitted that she had only said that because she was mad at him and that he had never raped her. For the next few years, Centoya would continue to get into trouble, pulling fire alarms, cussing teachers, assaulting a teacher, smoking pot, and skipping school. When the Department of Children's Services stepped in, Centoya hurled a chair at the social worker. That landed her in Woodland Hills, a juvenile detention center, or juvie, with a chain-link fence with rolls of razor wire along the top. There, she continued to get in trouble, causing at least 20 fights. When she was 14, the state psychiatrist ordered a series of medications for depression and anxiety. Doctors noted that Centoya had violent mood swings and was often irrational. She was in constant fear of abandonment and betrayal. She had little self-worth and didn't trust anyone. After 15 months in juvie, Centoya was released back into the custody of Ellenette Brown. 
That is when Elinette informed her that while she was in juvie, Thomas had left and moved to Virginia. The pair had gotten divorced. She was also informed about Elinette's new boyfriend, Frank. Frank was an old friend whom Centoya had met before, so he wasn't a stranger. However, Centoya had never been fond of him. She began acting out again shortly after her release, drinking, getting stoned, skipping school, etc. It wasn't long before she stopped coming home altogether. She had gone to Nashville and was often seen sneaking into nightclubs, popping ecstasy, smoking pot, drinking, and partying until sunrise. Whenever she needed money, she would either sell crack cocaine or sell sexual favors to guys in the club she was sneaking into. She was raped at least three times, and her friend, Shokasha, said that when Centoya told her about the rape, Centoya would laugh. She said one of Centoya's common coping mechanisms was to laugh or crack jokes when most people would cry. Then Centoya met Garion McLaughlin, otherwise known as Cutthroat, or Cut for short. He was 24, she was 16. They hung out and got high together all day. He turned her on to cocaine. It didn't take long for Centoya to begin dropping weight. Dark circles formed under her eyes. She couldn't seem to get enough coke. The coke was expensive, however, and Cut wanted her to start paying for it. He didn't care how she got the money, as long as she got it. She tried to leave him, but he raped her and threatened to kill her. About a month before the murder, she called Elinette. Elinette begged her to just leave him, but Centoya told her that if she did that, Cut would kill Elinette. So Centoya had no choice but to stay. Her only moments of peace in her mind was when she was high on cocaine, because on coke she could separate herself from the horror her life had become. Cut often threatened her with a gun, and at least once he choked her until she lost consciousness. Cut had an extensive rap sheet, but it wasn't major crimes. Centoya didn't know that he was a suspect in an attempted homicide, which occurred during an armed robbery, but she wasn't surprised months later when she was told about that. By the summer of 2004, Cut often sent Centoya out to work the streets. Sometimes she would rob the guys who picked her up, but if she thought it was too dangerous, she would perform the service they were paying for and take the money that they agreed upon. Centoya kept a 40 caliber handgun in her purse. I read one account that stated that Cut provided the gun and another account that stated that Centoya purchased the gun. Either way, she had that gun on her the night that would change her life forever. The following is the story that Brown told police. Cut sent Centoya out to work the streets on Friday, August 6, 2004. A guy named Johnny picked Centoya up in a white pickup truck somewhere along Murfreesboro Road. He had a professional look about him. She was uncomfortable but not afraid. She told him that she was hungry, so he took her to Sonic and bought her food. They went back to his house and ate dinner together. The living room had clearly been decorated by a woman and was very warm and welcoming. Centoya relaxed a little. After dinner, Johnny suggested they go downstairs in the split-level home. They entered a den that was very manly looking. Johnny showed Centoya his gun collection, bragged about his shooting skills, and informed Brown that he was a sharpshooter in the United States Army. To most women, that may be impressive, but Centoya had been raised in Clarksville, Tennessee, just minutes from Fort Campbell, Kentucky. She had been raised by an army man who was verbally abusive to her and physically abusive to her mother. Soldiers didn't impress her. They scared her. She said Johnny turned on the TV and the two watched TV together. Eventually, they ended up in the bedroom. After he tried to kiss her a few times, she told him that she didn't want to do anything sexual. She laid down on the bed, but didn't specify what her state of dress was. Johnny took off his shirt, but left his pants on and laid down. She said he got up numerous times and left the room only to return a few minutes later and lie back down beside her. She didn't know what he did each time he left the room, but her level of discomfort rose every time he returned. Here's Centoya explaining to the juvenile court what was going through her head that night. Is there anything that made you especially nervous that night? Um, just how he was acting. Just how he talked. It's like the way he talked. How he was just so important and stuff. And then me, I look at myself, who am I? Who am I to him? It's like, then he talks about the guns and stuff. If he does something to me, I'm sitting here thinking, what can I do? I'm in his house. Ain't nobody going to know where I'm at. My mom and them, they don't know where I'm at. The people that I stay with, chick on them, they don't know where I'm at. Nobody's going to know what happens to me. Cut, he doesn't care. 
he doesn't even know who I left with. And all this is just running through my mind, and I'm just a nervous wreck. The last time he came back in the room, he removed his pants and boxers and climbed into the bed next to her. She stated that she was nervous and scared. He reached out and caressed her shoulder. He then reached for her crotch, and she pulled farther away. She said at that point he rolled over and faced the wall. She thought he might be reaching for a gun, so she quickly pulled the handgun out of her purse, leveled, and fired one shot into the back of his head. She grabbed his wallet and truck keys out of his pants that he had recently shed and ran downstairs. She snatched two guns out of the gun cabinet because she knew better than to go back to cut with nothing after being gone for three or four hours, and she didn't know how much, if any, cash was in the wallet. She was in too big of a hurry to stop and count it. She just wanted to get out of that house. She drove straight to the hotel and lugged the large guns up to her room. When she walked in, Cut started yelling at her for bringing them up without concealing them. It was the middle of the night. She wasn't concerned about that. She left immediately and drove the truck to Walmart, which was about a half a mile away from the hotel. She locked the doors and left it in the parking lot. Upon returning to the hotel room, she got high as the events of the previous hours haunted her. The following day, Centoya stayed drugged up and glued to the TV, watching for information about the man she had shot the night before. After the evening news aired and didn't cover the story, she visited her neighbor, Richard Reed, whom she had known in Clarksville. She asked him for a ride to Walmart. Reed said that Sensoya told him about robbing a guy and shooting him. She told him that she had gotten $50,000 and that she would split it with him if he would take her back to the house. She later stated that she wasn't sure if Johnny was dead or not and wanted to go check on him. Reed refused to go to the house. Sentoya asked him to pull up next to the truck and wait. She climbed up in the truck and took Johnny's cell phone. Reed then took her back to the hotel. At 7.20 p.m., Centoya called 911 using Johnny Allen's cell phone. When asked what the emergency was, she simply said homicide. When asked where, she stated Johnny's address and then quickly hung up the phone. Later that evening, she watched as the story aired on the local news for the first time. It was confirmed that Johnny Allen was in fact dead. She got high and snorted some coke. At about 3 a.m. on August 8, 2004, police knocked on the door of her hotel room at the in-town suites. They arrested her without incident and took her downtown. When asked what her name was, she said Centoya Mitchell, her biological mother's last name, and gave a date of birth which would make her 18, not the 16 she actually was. Even in her drugged state, she was well aware of what was going on. The police asked her to sign her Miranda rights, which stated that by signing this, she affirms no promises were made by police. She called them out on the fact that they had just offered to tell the DA she cooperated so he would go lighter on her. She eventually signed and told them the whole story. The following clip is Centoya trying to explain her fear of cut to the psychologist who was hired by the defense. What's this guy cut? What's his real name? Gary Ann McLean. And then, what, so what was he like? I remember one time, the first time he did something to me is when he choked me and I passed out. Because he said I thought he was a joke. Uh huh. What else did he do to you? He talked real, real bad to me and he jacked me up. He pulled me by my hair and jacked me and stuff. He put guns up to me, got me to strip and stuff like that, getting out of the beaver. Did you ever have sex with the guys? When I cut, put a fucking gun up to me, I did. Did he did, did he have sex with you, too? Yeah, he had sex with me. Sometimes I don't want to have sex with him. He'd still fuck me. I'd be crying and everything. He'd so how, how come you stayed with him? You're not listening. I made him money. He wasn't going to let me go nowhere. He told me he'd kill me. He knows where my mom lives. And I'm not like, dude, choke me, so I almost passed out. He's not a perfect Although we don't know exactly what was said or what happened in the house, we do know that some of Centoria's story has to have occurred, such as the conversation about Alan's shooting experience. She would not have known that he was a sharpshooter in the Army if he had never told her that. Friends and family of Johnny say that he would never have picked up a prostitute and that he was probably just being a good Samaritan. When she was allowed to make a phone call, she called Shokasha and stated, I killed a man and they're charging me with murder. She laughed and said, I'm serious, I did. 
Shokasha wasn't surprised by the laugh because Centoya often laughed when telling her about the horrors of her life. The laugh did strike detectives as very odd, however, and they would later use that against her. She was held in juvie until they sent her to a mental health facility where she was housed for a short time while they conducted mental evaluations. She would fly into violent and destructive rages. After attacking a nurse, she was restrained by both arms and both legs. She screamed something to the effect of, I shot that man in the back of the head, and bitch, I'm going to shoot you three times in the back of the head, and would love to see your blood splatter on the wall. The facility administered a number of tests, one of which was an IQ test. The average IQ is 100. Centoya scored 127. She also scored rather high on tests for borderline personality disorder. She was also showing classic symptoms, violent outbursts, mood swings, paranoia, turbulent personality connections, desire to impress others, and so on. They could not officially diagnose her with it, though, because she was only 16 years of age, and one has to be 18 to be diagnosed with a personality disorder. When the mental health facility completed their evaluation, Centoya went to court, at which time the juvenile judge would decide if the case should be heard in juvenile court or if Brown should be charged as an adult and the case should be moved to criminal court. In Tennessee, every person in the juvenile justice system ages out at age 19. Regardless of what they are in for, they are released free and clear and their record is expunged on their 19th birthday. Centoya was about four months shy of her 17th birthday when she appeared in juvenile court. As is often the case, the judge decided that if Brown did murder Johnny Allen, two years and four months was not a sufficient sentence, so she ruled that Centoya Brown would be tried as an adult. At her trial in criminal court, the prosecution focused on a few things. One was the position of the body. Allen died lying on his side with his fingers clasped beside his head. The medical examiner testified that Allen could not have moved into that position after being shot the way that he was. The defense argued that there is really no way to know how a particular person would be able to function after being shot in the head. She cited other cases in which people were shot and then did amazing things after the bullet entered their brains. The DA also stated that he didn't believe Brown's statement that she thought Allen was reaching for a gun because no gun was found on the side of the bed. The defense argued that Brown never stated she saw a gun, just that her fear was that there was a gun. The prosecution played the following phone call between Centoya and Ellenette, which took place shortly after the juvenile judge passed the case to criminal court. <laughs> I know the clip is kind of hard to understand, but I wanted to play it for you because so many people use this recording to support the theory that it was intentional. In case you couldn't make it out, Centoya says, I probably won't have a life anyways, Ma. It don't matter how I behave. You don't understand what I did. I killed somebody. Ellenette says, I know you did. Centoya says, I executed him. Then Ellenette says, I know you did. They claim that due to her use of the word executed, it was an intentional premeditated murder. The defense didn't dispute that. They also failed to call their own psychologist to testify, nor did they present any of Brown's background. Whether or not that would have impacted the jury, we'll never know. The jury returned a guilty verdict. Centoya was sentenced to life in prison. She filed every appeal possible and lost every one of them. Since her incarceration, she has gotten her GED and her associate's degree. She is expected to earn her bachelor's degree in the spring of 2019. Her case piqued the interest of some celebrities, such as Kim Kardashian, Rihanna, Snoop Dogg, and others, as well as organizations who fight against sex trafficking. It has gained attention in the last few years. In December 2018, she was back in court where her attorneys were arguing that life sentences without parole were unconstitutional due to a 2012 Supreme Court ruling. The judge ruled that the Tennessee law requiring a minimum of 51 years before parole eligibility is constitutional and commuted her sentence to life with the eligibility of parole after 51 years which means that she will be 69 years of age by the time she's eligible for parole. 
Also in December of 2018, Tennessee Governor Bill Haslam stated that he was familiarizing himself with Centoya's case, among others, before determining clemency on them. On December 21st, Haslam released a list of 11 names that would be granted either freedom or reduced sentences. Brown's name was not on the list. A protest took place on January 5, 2019, in front of Haslam's office. The governor would soon be replaced by Governor-elect Bill Lee. In one final act before leaving office on January 7, 2019, Governor Haslam announced that Brown would receive clemency, and he set her release date as August 7, 2019, exactly 15 years from the date of her arrest. There is much controversy surrounding this case. Some believe that Centoya shot Johnny in cold blood for the sole purpose of robbing him. They often cite the recorded phone call when Centoya told Alanette, I executed him. They say her use of the word executed is indication that she was not acting in fear, but rather a position of power. Some say that due to her laughter when she called Shokasha, they believe it was intentional. Others have stated that she had robbed a number of Johns before and never felt the need to shoot them. They believe her laughter is due to her coping mechanism that Shokasha had mentioned, that Centoya tended to laugh when most would cry. They feel that due to her upbringing by an abusive man, fear that was instilled by Cut, and Johnny's own comments about his shooting experience, that she reacted out of fear for her life. The police have stated that due to the position Johnny was lying in when he died, it was clear to them that she shot him while he was sleeping. There is no physical evidence to support that other than the position of the body. What I mean is that we don't know if he had just moved into that position or if he had been in that position for some length of time. There is no way to prove whether he was awake or asleep at the time the bullet hit him. If you look at the crime scene photos, which I've posted on our blog at MinorMurderers.com, I can see both sides of that argument. In the photo showing Alan's full back, I can see how Brown might think he was going for a gun if she shot him as soon as he rolled into that position. I can also see in the photo where his hands are clasped that he was probably getting into position to go to sleep, or maybe he was asleep. A few others state that she shot Johnny because she was afraid of returning to cut empty-handed. What do you think? Was Johnny Allen shot in cold blood, or was Centoya defending herself from her perceived fear? Should she have done time? Was life the appropriate sentence? How do you feel about Governor Haslam granting clemency? Join the discussion on our blog at MinorMurderers.com, on Facebook.com slash MMCWK, or on Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, or Patreon at Minor Murderers. You can also shoot us an email at minormurderers at outlook.com or leave a voicemail at 615-348-5562. I put links to all of them in the show notes. We may read some of your comments or play your voicemail on a future episode. Please let me know if you do not want your comments aired. Have a great month and we'll see you on February 28th when we release episode 2, Jamarion Lawhorn.